Welcome to episode 46 of the Croydon Constitutionalist podcast, bringing classical liberalism to South London and beyond via our YouTube channel and wherever you get your podcasts. My name is Dan Heaton and my partner in podcasting today is Mike Swaddling, the co-founder of the Croydon Constitutionalists. Mike, how are things with you? Uh, well, other than in a second lockdown, uh, yes, okay. I guess the only saving grace this time is uh, the weather is such that I'm, I might not be venturing out too much anyway. You mean you haven't been going for a jog every morning? It was second on my list. Fair enough. Uh, well, I'm delighted to say that we are welcome to the podcast today, Dick Dellingpole. Uh, Dick describes himself on his Twitter bio as James's brother, libertarian, not a bedwetter, and an occasional historical French soldier. Uh, well, on that, uh, welcome, Dick. Uh, hi. It's a pleasure to have you on board today. Pleasure to be here. So, Mike, what have we got to discuss today? So, uh, the US election results, and, and if we can call them results yet, uh, lockdown 2.0. Uh, we bring a, a, an update on our regular feature, despite Brexit. Unfortunately, we bring another update on our regular feature, Croydon Council. Um, and then we have a chat with Dick and then talk through what's on our website. Well, yes. Well, what's been going on lately? Well... Um, yeah, it looks like we might all be riding with Biden, as they uh, as they say on some on some T-shirts over in the states. The uh, the U.S. elections have uh, well they've taken place. I'm not sure they're absolutely concluded yet because there's uh, been some uh, a bit of a shambles, really. Uh, yes, on election night, it uh, it appeared that Donald Trump may have been heading for uh, re-election, only for the some of the counts to kind of stop and then some mail-in ballots turn up and uh, now it looks like uh, Mr Biden has in fact uh, won the presidency. Uh, Mike what have you made of the uh, the way the count was organised? I know in obviously in America we're not talking about an election we're talking about 50 elections in 50 states uh, but I having and, and you and I know this well having stood for office and stood at many accounts in the Fairfield Halls and uh, Trinity School in Croydon um, the system over here works pretty well. Uh, you know, a ballot box has has votes put in it. Um, that gets sealed. There's a whole bunch of people in that room when that happens. It comes into the counting hall. We see it come in. We see them open it. We see them fold open the bits of paper, and we see them count them. And it's not without problems, but it's it's pretty good, you know. And, and you might look at it and go... Um, you know, when the results come in, you, you're able to sample enough to have an idea of whether they're roughly right or not. How is it we can organise that, but a country as advanced as America can't? It shouldn't be beyond the wit of man to follow a process that works pretty well. And even with the postal votes here, you know, we know the postal votes are opened and verified as a valid vote. Uh, bef and I know postal voting systems over here are, are fraught with problems, but a valid piece of paper came in from a voter it's validated the vote isn't checked at that stage it goes into another sealed box and they get counted in with the rest of them it's a pretty efficient system um why don't they just do that yeah it's a strange one it seems that the, in some states at least the postal votes didn't actually have to arrive even on the on the day of the election uh, I don't know if they're going off postmarks or something like that, and uh, they can turn up for a, up to a week afterwards, perhaps. It, it's a very strange way to uh, to go about it, and of course, it's caused an absolute uproar, obviously with the uh, with the Trump campaign, and uh, it looks like there may be a, a number of court cases on the go. Uh, Dick, did you uh, did you stay up all night watching the uh, the election result? Well, I kind of knew there would be very little point in doing so because these things do have a tendency to drag out in the States. But uh, uh, the, I agree with you that the result has been a complete shambles, but I'm far more bullish on the fact that I think there's been massive fraud going on on the part of the Democrats. I think the hatred for Trump 
was so massive that they would stop at nothing to 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 win this thing you know by fair means or foul and uh I think the fact that Trump is still fighting is wonderful, but I think it's disgusting the way how many uh, former conservatives over here have just given up the ghost already and are prepared to hand the election to Biden. Well, certainly he's been described as president-elect Biden by uh, by Boris Johnson uh, just in the in the last couple of days when uh, when talking about it, apparently he had a, had a conversation with him. Um, if it is to be Biden, um, there seems to be all kinds of issues in terms of his uh, Irish ancestry and his uh, his dislike of Britain, allegedly, and his, his concerns over over Brexit and uh, whether or not he wants to do a, a trade deal with us. But um, but yeah, Mike, did you uh, did you notice the uh, the issues over the uh, the libertarian votes and um, the impact that that they may have had? Yeah, in the the libertarian vote in all of the the um, and I take Dick's point there that the amount of votes that have suddenly come in during the counting phase for the Democrats is I'm not going to be quite as bullish, but is incredibly questionable, and it's absolutely right that that gets questioned. You know, that's why there's a load a load of observers. That's why there are court, courts. You know, challenge it. That's that's what should be happening. Um, but interestingly, yes, in the in the the knife edge states. Um, the libertarians got more votes than the, um, uh, the than, than the gap that Biden has over over the Republicans. Now, I, I don't know. I, I the, the libertarians really underperformed. I think uh, they they sh- could have and sh- perhaps should have done better. Bear in mind, whilst I think we all probably like Donald Trump, um, lots of people don't, and and you know, there's lots of Republicans that could legitimately vote for someone else. And it's not like Biden inspired anyone. Um, uh, you know, there's lots of Democrats that should have voted for the Republican, uh, sorry, for the Libertarian perhaps as well. I think it's a real danger to assume the third party vote would have gone to the side that you're annoyed has lost um, because it, it probably wouldn't have, they probably would have stayed at home or they might have split. Um, so yeah, a, a disappointing night for the Libertarians, um, uh, but but it will just add to the... Uh, fever around who won and who lost and where who should have voted for whom yeah i, t- I take um i take dick's point it was a, a somewhat bizarre that all of these mail-in ballots that start turning up you know after the election has concluded uh, they did seem to be disproportionately in favor of biden which i don't know maybe it's because democrats were more likely to postal vote who knows but it was a uh, it was a strange coincidence that the uh, the percentage of votes in those bags of, ma- of mail-in ballots, as they call them, did seem to be disproportionately for Biden. Uh, but uh, but as you say, Trump is still fighting the uh, fighting the good fight, as it were, and he's got his uh, his legal team going out there trying to find out how many dead people voted for Biden. Um, I, I saw uh, the uh, the former mayor of New York, uh, Giuliani. He was on uh, he was on TV. Uh, talking about somebody who'd in fact registered to vote uh, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, the day after they died. So we'll have to see if anything comes of this. Certainly, they'll be uh, they'll be putting the uh, as much effort in as they possibly can do to to find out. You know, it, it might just be a question of what evidence they can possibly find, but certainly it does. Uh, it, some of it does look quite suspicious. Um, Mike, what have you made of the uh, the other election results in the uh, for the Senate and, uh, and Congress? There's an interesting lack of down ticket Democrat votes, and I think that is actually a feature of Democrat votes generally. Um, I think some of the uh, more zany members of the squad have helped drive this as well. Um, but the House that the Dems were expected to to pick up quite a lot of seats in, uh, they've lost. We think 15 seats. Uh, looking at the numbers at the moment, but it, but it, that's still subject to confirmation. Uh, the 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 governor of Montana, Montana flipped to the Republicans. The Republicans picked up loads of state seats, uh, state houses, and senates as well. They certainly flipped both in um, uh, New Hampshire. The Dems didn't make the gains I expected. That's really important this year. Um, uh, years with a zero uh, are years that that if you win the state houses and senates that year get to do the redistricting and that's going to be really important for the next decade 
uh, in in terms of seats. I, uh, if anyone's if anyone's ever seen a map of the MPs constituencies in Britain, they're broadly sort of oval shaped in the most part. If you see a map of the constituencies for the House in the US, you will notice that they are completely crazy shapes, and that's because it's all gerrymandered. Um, and 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 frankly, if you own the state houses, you get to do the gerrymandering, and that's. Um, uh, you know, good, good for the Republicans, bad for the Democrats. It may also suggest that lots of people feel in the ballot for Biden and not bothering voting for anyone else, but who knows. One little note I wanted to pick up on from the, the US, which I thought was really interesting. Um, in California, which obviously hugely voted for Biden, there was a, a, uh, a, a, a referendum item on there, and they have lots of these in the US, to end the diversity ban, uh, which was going to repeal a constitutional provision to make it unlawful for California state and local government to discriminate or, or grant a, a preferential treatment to people based on race, ethnicity, national origin, or sex. Now that was uh, that did not pass. So basically, it's still unlawful to discriminate in people in California. That's really interesting. That even in a it, with all the BLM protests, with all of the wokery that's going on, with a massive uh, Democratic wave uh, vote in California. They still couldn't get the kind of things they believe in past. People are still want to treat people like people, not like identity objects. Well, that's somewhat reassuring. Uh, I noticed that when they have these elections, obviously they have state elections and, and Senate and Congress as, as well as president every so often. Uh, but they, like you say, they are, they have these uh, proposals on the on the ballot paper. And there was an interesting one I noticed from uh, from Oregon. Um, it looks like they've sort of decriminalized all drugs <laughs> by the look of it um, did, did you notice this bit of news i didn't but it, it's a, it's a super libertarian move really isn't it i mean uh, it, it it's it's typical of that state but um it, did it pass yes yeah that that one has actually passed yeah so Good lord I think it's you. Basically, the headline is you. You'll well, it's passed in terms of the referendum. There'll be no jail time for small amounts of uh, of well, any drug class. Well, I think, or, that, or I think that's else. I think that's thoroughly sensible. I mean, I, I'm I'm quite extreme on the libertarian scale for a belief in uh, freedom to do whatever you like to yourself as long as it doesn't affect others, and that definitely, uh, well, it it will keep the prisons empty of uh, of of people who are guilty of no more than smoking a reefer. Uh, yeah, and, and then some by the look of this with well, the yeah, class it, it, A drugs. Yeah, yeah but, uh, <laughs> knock, knock yourself out, guys. You know, <laughs> exactly. quite literally. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it'll be. I mean, there's been a, a lot of uh, a lot of states have been decriminalizing, or I mean, I think some states have effectively legalized to, to a, a great extent uh, cannabis. You can you can buy cannabis in shops in. Um, Oh, for medical now. reasons, though, isn't it? And technically, I think you still have to have some sort of uh, scrawled note written by a bogus doctor before you can do this in most states. But uh, uh, yeah, it's it, it seems to be uh, happening right across some of the more liberal states. And uh, as I say, I don't I don't see that as a bad thing. But when you look at uh, uh, the, the how bad things are in towns like Portland, you wouldn't want to take the whole package. No, no, quite no, not. No, no, no. Mike, was it Ontario that actually legalised cannabis? Yes, I'm pretty sure it was. It was. I think. It, I think it was. It's, uh, yes, it's to, in Toronto. You can, you can buy. You can go to state. Ah, oh, that was the thing, wasn't it? It was. They were. You had to go to like a state Owned shop. shop. That's yes. right. Yes. Yeah, so government as drug dealer. <laughs> state that, owns the means to getting high. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Yes. So that's. Uh, so not not all uh, not all good news on that. On that front, <laughs> if, the, uh, if the state's going to uh, control it, you know. Uh, but there you go. Uh, anyway, let's move on from the states. We've got our own issues here, haven't we? Um, we've got COVID lockdown two, electric boogaloo. Uh, I'm not so sure this sequel's uh, any better than the first one, though. Unfortunately, so Boris Johnson poo pooed the uh, the idea of a two week circuit breaker when it was put forward by uh, by Keir Starmer. He said, "No, no, no, we don't want that. Let's have a four week, you know, complete lockdown. That seems like a far more sensible idea. So there's no pubs, no gyms, next to no shops." 
uh, all seemingly based on some uh, dodgy graph, some of the gruesome twosome. Mike, how have we got ourselves into this situation again? I, I, I just despair. Um, what's, what's the point of planning anything? What's the point of businesses trying to operate? Uh, and, what, and what's the point? And, and these graphs, I mean, our numbers and, and, and test rates, we know the tests are all nonsense with hugely high false positives. They're just making it up as they go along. And, and they, they thought, well, we might as well do something else now. Let's do a lockdown. It's something different for a while. Um, you know, the worst government in British history, the worst prime minister in British history, uh, twice now taking away our, our liberty and freedom. And, you know, there was a lot of people out of pubs a lot prior to this lockdown. I was one of them. I never got tracked or traced, although I gave my details because it, it was just a thing I had to do. And particularly, I often go to a members club, so... They know me because because you know I'm tagged in and what have you. Um, it's it's a nonsense. People know it's a nonsense, and and I think we're seeing that reflected in the fact that people aren't taking this lockdown very seriously. Dick, you were probably a bit of a fan of Boris Johnson, uh, rather like we were about uh, this about a year ago. Where a lot yeah, guilty as charged. Yeah, I, I like you. I probably uh, I. I voted for him, expecting him to be the the, the liberty loving oaf that uh, that we you know we we forgave him all his foibles because he was one of us. And uh, yeah, com- what happened to that Boris? He's completely disappeared. He, as you say, Mike, he couldn't be worse. Um, but you know, I see it as our duty to defy these ridiculous rules in any way we can, and I'm I'm certainly doing that. But what's the point when you know you can't go to the pub, you can't go to your favourite cafe, as you say, all the shops are closed and businesses are struggling to to move on. And so we've got to start wondering whether this is even about the virus. Is it this big reset that the, the great reset, the um, you know the uh, the thing that we are discussing as being a possibility that was a conspiracy theory not so long ago. Uh, is it incompetence or is it something more sinister? I just, I, I don't know whether it's the Great Reset or not, but I do know there's something more sinister at play than it just being incompetence. Uh, and, and, and do you know, do you know, we feel you know that rather than just feel it or think it. Uh, I, I heard on one, on one show, I thought it was a good phrase, was something like a, 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 a confluence of of opportunities and, and it was something like that I might have misquoted it but it's, it was this idea that there's a lot of people that have got a lot of plans that they've always quite liked and and Covid's come along and they can bring them in because all the plans are always about closing down business centralizing power telling people how to live uh to you know finding that people making free choices was a bit annoying for this person in government so they're going to make some choices for you and, and COVID becomes the overarching opportunity to do that. Now, whether that's part of a great reset uh, as, as a plan or part of a great reset, just as a, a you know, a hundred opportunities, a thousand flowers blooming, as uh, a communist may have once said, uh, I don't know if he was running our government still or not. But, um, you know, and, and that's that seems to be what's happening to me, uh, at the very least, is that there are a lot of people who have always wanted to tell us what we're doing wrong. And not so much tell us, actually impose a different way on us. And wow, haven't they found that opportunity? I mean, there is the whole World Economic Forum, which is really sort of Dr. Evil and his lair. And uh, it, it they've laid out quite clearly what they think should be the Great Reset. And these guys have been meeting regularly at Davos year after year. And all our leaders go there and are enthralled to them. I think you've got to give a certain amount of credence to the fact that they may finally be seizing the opportunity to implement these plans. Yeah, absolutely. So, so one thing I do want to pick up on COVID, uh, on the lockdown at the moment, just very quickly, is the Welsh exams. And I don't know whether, Dick, you've got any thoughts on these, um, but the particularly uh, has worried me. The Welsh, uh, in Wales, they've already cancelled the exams for next year. Um, now, they've coming up with a different system of assessing pupils, uh, but that means they've got to come up with that and implement it and deliver it all within the next six months or so, uh, uh, something that doesn't exist today. The argument being pupils of, 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 you know, they're not in a level playing field. Well, they're not, but guess what? They never are. And, and I'm a school governor at a couple of places. I've seen some data from schools suggesting something like half the pupils have really regressed 
in their learning in the past year in schools I've seen that that may or may not be replicated wider. What's more interesting with that I found was that the more complex uh, stuff that pupils were doing, the more they've regressed, which as you might expect, actually, if you're not doing it regularly. Um, if you add that to the pupils in Wales now, you say not only have you lost all this education, but we're going to take the foot off the pedal for exams for next year. It's not one year they've lost, it's two years they've lost. You know, they're paying us to work, work at home. They're, they're setting these kids up to foul for life. I, such an appalling thing to, to happen already. And and it does actually play into that narrative of a great reset because the last thing you want is, frankly, an educated populace. Well, I think that ship has pretty much sailed. We've had years and years of cultural Marxism embedding very firmly in our schools. So uh, essentially, our kids were being brainwashed anyway. I mean, both my kids uh, attended local state school before my daughter got um, a sixth form scholarship at the public school I was at, Malvern, where incidentally, I was there with Chris Whitty for, um, for my sins. But um, that they, they, they were effectively brainwashed. They're, they're, they're fairly woke, and it's only because they're bright enough to see through the worst of it that they're, they're bearable company. But, you know, the, if you're worried about brainwashed kids, that ship sailed long ago. And, and this is probably just a continuation of that. Well, hey, d don't worry, though, guys, because um, within a, a week of the uh, US election uh, taking place, and what seemingly is going to be uh, Biden taking over from Trump, uh, there's a vaccine on the way. Hooray. Yes, Pfizer have announced, oh, yes, we've got this really promising uh, vaccine, and it's going to be ready by the, uh, the end of the year. Uh, the government's already saying it's going to be getting so many million, millions of, uh, of doses of uh, vaccine, so you'll, be, uh, you'll be presumably be queuing up, will you, Dick, for your, uh, your vaccine in the, in the new year? <laughs> well, I, I will probably be classified by the uh, the opposition as being an anti-vaxxer, which is far from the truth for most of uh, most of us libertarians. We're, we're quite happy to take uh, uh, decent long term tested vaccines. But this is quite definitely a rushed vaccine. And uh, for, for a disease that has what a mortality rate of 0.03 percent or something like that. So, you know, it, it's an unnecessary vaccine in the first place. So I, I certainly will be at the very back of the queue for this. And the worrying thing is the amount of talk about somehow making this thing compulsory. It, it beggars belief. Uh, you know, we're, we're seeing dark times indeed if you are forced to be vaccinated. So, Mike, are you going to be uh, popping along for your, your shot? No, it's exactly the same feeling on this. Um, you know, uh, I, if we've got a vaccine, fantastic. Um, let's, you know, get that properly tested and out to people. And if people want to take it, that's, that's you know, superb. Isn't, isn't that a testament to human ingenuity? Um, but but completely agree with Dick. This can't be forced upon people. Um, if ever there was a way for a back lash against this it, it's to do that and and there's forced both directly and coerced through you're not allowed to do things without it it's Let's the get coercion it out. that worries me yeah absolutely get it out there i'm sure more than enough people want to take it and build up a herd immunity and frankly once you know once you've seen a couple of million people take it um or and and critically the cabinet the mps the uh, medical establishment take it, then you can think, well, well, why not? Why, why wouldn't I want to protect myself from this? But then that's your choice. And it's absolutely got to be about choice. Yeah, I, I mean, I've seen the sort of the rollout plan, uh, such as, you know, the, the vaccine is going to go to old people and, and people with, uh, with various conditions first, and they'll kind of work their way down the, the at-risk groups. I have to say, by the time that they would, uh, they would get to me, uh, I'm, I'm pretty certain we've already achieved herd immunity because there's that many people these days who were, I don't know, over 50 or whatever, you know, or let alone over 70. Um, and, and apparently there's that many people with, with various health conditions that are, we're pretty much got herd immunity, I think, by the time it, uh, it gets to me. But yeah, I'm particularly concerned about the, the coercion element, uh, whether it's saying, I mean, how they would ever implement this, but so, so, Mike, you're a, a, a season ticket holder at, at Crystal Palace for your uh, for your sins. Are they going to say you've got to have some sort of COVID passport to, to get into the game? I, absolutely, and that you know that is the worry that, that they try to impose that kind of thing. Um, the 
idea of checking what would be 25,000 COVID passports on, on a Saturday afternoon. Uh, you know, good luck with that, guys. Um, I, there has been some rumours of that kind of thing, but you just think the practicalities of this don't work. Um, and I, but yeah, that it, it's hard enough to want to go. It's hard enough to want to go to Crystal Palace at the best of times. And I, I say that as a season ticket holder for the better part of 30 years, uh, don't put more barriers in my way. Yeah. I can definitely see some businesses saying that, you know, you will not be allowed onto our, into our office or onto our site unless you have some evidence of, of, of having had this, uh, this vaccine. And um, I'm not really sure what we can, uh, what we can do about that. Do you know, the thing, you, the, the thing we can do about that is, is businesses want to be careful what they wish for. Um, if, if your company is saying it wants details of your medical records and what vaccines you've had, and that they can store that and they've got all the right information security around that and it won't leak, um, then that's a brave choice. That's a big choice for them to make. Uh, and I think possibly the way forward to fight some of this might well be if someone wants proof of, of my medical uh, certification, they need to give me proof that they're going to store that data. And the, day, the moment they lose it, people need to be suing the hell out of them. Well, it's going to be a case of uh, uh, get woke, go broke, isn't it? I mean, if you've got two pubs next to each other, one of them takes all comers, the other one uh, demands some sort of wristband, you're going to go to the you're going to go to the open one and take your chances, aren't you? Absolutely, absolutely that. Well, moving on, uh, we are now only a few weeks away <laughs> from the end of the transition period. Well, despite Brexit, there is uh, some very good news. Uh, Rolls-Royce had to create 6,000 jobs in the North and the Midlands, uh, where they're going to be making components for mini nuclear power plants. Uh, and there's potentially up to 34,000 jobs in the next 15 years. And uh, Mike, ex- I've got two questions. Sounds like really, really good, uh, good bit of news for us. And will you be getting a mini nuclear power plant in your backyard? Firstly, uh, it's thank God for having some good news. <laughs> at last it does sound great news um my mini nuclear power plant will be in my uh, garden shed next to where i'm currently fitting a flux capacitor so uh, yeah i can't wait until this happens um and uh, yeah uh, uh why not this is we we need we need power in the future um uh, we can't only have it when the wind blows uh, and so the more the more Nuclear power plants, mini, maxi, whatever, the, the better. Dick, will you be uh, will you be installing one of these? Well, uh, like Mike, uh, he's, he's bang on the money there. It's uh, it, it's a wonderful thing, a that uh, British industry is producing this sort of thing, but two, it shows you that um, there is a genuine understanding that wind and solar is not going to cut it, and and the more we go over to renew, so-called renewables. Um, the, the, the more we will realise that it's not going to provide the power we need for the future. So uh, the, the mini new power station things is, has been mooted for quite a while. I'm really encouraged to see it going ahead because that surely is the way forward. But will Extinction Rebellion approve of it? I really hope they don't, because if they do, I might have to look at it again. Well, they've been, uh, they've been uh, doing their usual this week with the Remembrance Day and... Uh, causing trouble at the uh, the cenotaph so uh not know what they're going to make of these uh, nuclear power plants but um yeah no it's good news for uh, good news for british industry and uh, hey we'll we'll maybe we will make that carbon neutral target or whatever we've uh, what we've set ourselves up to uh, to do well mike it's happened we have foretold it we have spoke about it on numerous occasions on this podcast and in numerous articles for our website, Croydon Council has gone bankrupt. The Section 114 notice has been issued and they can only now do essential spending. No more frivolity from the uh, Costa Mint walk. Mike, is it a bit of an anticlimax for you? Um, it, it shouldn't be. I, I think I'm right in saying this is only the second council to do that this century. Um, 
that's not insignificant. Um, it, it's going to be a huge impact to the people of Croydon over the next decade or more. Um, and and uh, it is, it is a, a pretty momentous occasion, but it has been coming. I mean, I, I put together something on our website the other day of, of um, what we've covered and what we've said about Croydon Council's finances since the Croydon Constitutionists were formed two and a half years ago. And, and there's loads of stuff we've been putting out. Uh, there's loads of stuff for a couple of years. Um, some of that is is using data that's then a couple of years older still, just because you know that's it, it sometimes takes time for that data to be published. Um, people have been saying for a long time the council is spending money unnecessarily, inefficiently, um, uh, and without due due care and attention. Um, not just us now; the auditors are saying that uh, they're making it very very clear. Uh, I just want a quick quote here. Members of the Scrutiny and Overview Committee accepted the responses received and did not refer the matter to full council. In our view, this did not demonstrate an understanding of the urgency of the financial position. That's pretty strong words for an auditor. Councillor Sean Fitzsimmons, who runs his Scrutiny and Overview Committee, who's very active on Twitter, very quick to criticise, ought to be thoroughly ashamed for the way he's completely stitched up the people of Croydon, uh, not doing his job. Uh, it is a big deal um it's it's come as no surprise as you say yeah so i'm certainly not going to look forward to the the council tax rises that i'm going to be no doubt getting over the over the next couple of years uh dick you you may have noticed this because it's it's finally with this uh with this issuing of this uh of this statement it's uh it's finally hit the the national headlines to some extent um have you ever heard of a of a of a council purchasing the freehold of a hotel is that what they've done in croydon so they've done many things but one of them was purchasing the freehold of a hotel that hotel the business is now in administration well how, how long did that take uh, not very long after they did <laughs> after they <bought. laughs> also also a, a sort of out of town shopping uh, place and um, they've had this shambolic, what's called brick by brick, um, company that they that they set up, and that's a wholly owned subsidiary almost of Croydon Council, uh, with a, a view to building, is it affordable homes, Mike? I'm I'm not too sure on on this the, the way this brick by brick works, but what I do know is it hasn't worked, and it's cost a ridiculous amount of money. But essentially, the, the council has not just been spending money on things that maybe we wouldn't want them to spend the money on, maybe a bit too much on diversity. I mean, you know, any money spent on on diversity officers is is, is ludicrous. But they've also gone into areas that, frankly, are, are not areas that the the public sector should be getting into. Nothing, nothing for councils to be involved in, in the uh, the running of hotels, etc. Um, and it, they've, uh, you know, they're, they're getting their comeuppance now. Well, it sounds like a, a, a beautiful thing to observe. I mean, presumably we're talking about a, a Labour council here. Naturally. Well, it, it's, it's lovely to watch them unstuck, but we know that uh, the council taxpayer is going to be the one stuck with the bill for it. So it's, uh, you know, it, it, it's... Uh, is it going to change the way uh, the people of Croydon vote? Are they going to see through this? Are they going to carry on like lemmings as before? Well, Mike, I think you might want to uh, bring up one of your uh, one of your subjects there. Uh, yeah, indeed. So, so uh, funny that you should say that. I, um, we, I, I've been part of an organisation for the past year or so that's uh, trying to get a democratic elected mayor of Croydon. So, changing it from the the council group voting in who's in charge to uh, the people directly electing who's in charge. Um, and it, it's one of the government's models available. Um, and it was because we saw this car crash coming that we, we knew that the model of governance in Croydon needs to change. Um, hopefully that that will happen. There's, 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 we've, we've collected a petition. There will be a referendum at some point on it and, and people may vote for it. I think Labour will probably win. I, I think you're right. Uh, Croydon, um, for those that don't know, is, is kind of roughly roughly 60% deep red and 40% deep blue. And there's not, there used to be a bit in the middle that, that swung a bit. I'm not really sure that's there anymore. It's, it's kind of deep red or deep blue. Um, if Even if, if we get a democratic elected mayor, 
it, they will have to win votes everywhere. So they cannot be deep red in their outlook. Whereas under the current council model, they can be, and, and that has led to the car crash we've had, or at least they used to be able to, to be up until the point the government effectively took over the financing. Um, so, so hopefully that will change, but you, you are right. And I find that it's terribly concerning for democracy. And, and it's probably democracy everywhere that, that this council has completely screwed up. Um, and I'm sure are still in, in three years time likely to win a majority. And that, that's a, uh, sorry, two years time now. Uh, that's a deep, deep pity. Um, frankly, the conservative opposition hasn't always been great. Uh, and and we really need some other parties to to win some council seats in Croydon. But frankly, uh, I don't know if you do, Dan, but I don't see it happening. No, well, I mean, lest we forget, and in the interests of balance, uh, Cro uh, the Croydon Conservatives. Uh, which way did they uh, did they vote on the, uh, the the budget when it was uh, when it was done back in I, I guess April time was it? Certainly the last two, I think the last, oh, yes, the last three they voted for. This last emergency budget they voted against. They have, they have changed their leader and they have sharpened up their act, but that's two or three years too late. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see if uh, if it does make any difference. And uh, as you say, Mike, there's the, the whole democratically elected Mayor of Croydon campaign. Uh, which uh, I believe has got the required signatures to have a referendum, but uh, the, the current council is, uh, I suspect, using the COVID legislation to uh, try to kick that into the long grass. Uh, they are indeed, or they have been. Uh, the new leader is more open. Um, uh, uh, the new leader, Haminda, Councillor Haminda Ali, um, who who was part of the last uh, organised uh, the last administration, so should not be getting off scotch three out of this, but but. I think may have played quite a shrewd political game by 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 getting this section one one four notice out and and exposing every problem and blaming that all on Councillor Tony Newman, uh, the, who should receive most of the blame, who has completely screwed up this borough, um, but uh, or the borough council at least. Um, so so yeah, but she may have played quite a shrewd move. She's at least open to talk to people. She's not just rude. Something that Tony Newman uh, increasingly well, most of the time, just seem to be. You say she's not rude. She doesn't have just. a very high. She doesn't have a very high opinion of uh, Brexiteers, does she? No, she doesn't. Uh, that's that's my impression. But no, you know, you're right. But um, we we we've we've been bankrupted by one. Uh, at least this new one doesn't seem as uh, fanatical. It may be. It may be a small mercy, but let's be thankful for at least that. Absolutely. Well, Mike, I think you've uh, got a few questions for Dick. Yes. Uh, so, Dick, thanks again for joining us. That's uh, been fantastic having you on. Uh, no, it's been so fun. Far. Um, just want to talk, talk some things. So you, you, you've mentioned a couple of times you're a libertarian and uh, you have and organised some regular libertarian drinks in round your way. How did they come about and, and how do they go and... and Tell us a bit about them. Well, had it not been for um, lockdown, libertarian drinks would probably be thriving right across the country by now because it was really starting to, to pick up um, traction. Uh, it, it started initially through um, me being, um, well, let's say bored of the crowd that I used to drink with on a Wednesday, my reenactment mates. We, you know, we'd had all the conversations that were to be had. We were meeting every Wednesday at a different pub in Worcester, and I thought it was a really nice format. And I thought, well, don't go moping around. M make it happen. Don't, don't just complain about the situation you're in. What would you like to happen? So I thought, well, I would like to be drinking with the people I converse with on Twitter. Uh, how good would that be to have a pint with them? And so I put out the call essentially to say anyone fancy a pint and um the first night it was in my local weatherspoons not necessarily my favorite pub but quite a good one to do it in um a, a good sort of uh, dozen people turned up and we got on like a house on fire it was just fantastic and i think um irl as in in real life is the way ahead we, we're all constantly into our social media, but nothing really beats seeing someone's face as they're talking, um, sharing a laugh, uh, bringing in new people from, from outside. It, it's, 
it, it is crazy, but it's going back. It's rediscovering a, a forgotten skill that we all had, which was uh, conversing face to face with each other. No, absolutely, and that, uh, uh, yeah, that in real life, there's a crazy thought that we thought that that, that would be so hard to do, and it's great to get back to that. So you 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 got a dozen people out from sending out a tweet. Uh, you're becoming a bit of a star. Uh, obviously uh, on your brother's podcast and and uh, a good following on Twitter and lots of the right people retweeting you, I, I often notice. Yeah. How have you found that uh, over the last, I guess it's a couple of years or so, you've uh, become more to the fore. What's that, what's that been like for you? It, I, I won't lie, it's actually quite exciting and quite thrilling. I, I, I don't just see it as being, a, oh no, that's not really happening. Or, uh, it, I'm not a star at all. It, I, I revel in my Z-list celebrity status. It, it is really flattering when people say, oh, I've just been followed by Dick Dellingpole. And uh, it, 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 it's really, really nice. Um, and admittedly, a lot of it is on the back of having a, a more famous brother. But when you are a younger brother, you're used to being the sidekick. And uh, I've never had a problem with that. I, I'm not competing with him. We, we complement each other quite nicely. Uh, as you've probably both noticed, I'm the more organized of the two, but he's the one with the, um, with the gift of the gap. And uh, politically, the, you, you couldn't get a cigarette paper between us. You know, we believe in the same things. And um, uh, it, people appreciate honesty, integrity, and more than anything, consistency, which is a rarity among, well, should we call them conservatarians, conservatives, classical liberals, libertarians? I mean, the, the, the definition is, is a movable feast, but, uh, you know, consistency is a very valued uh, commodity these days. Uh, absolutely, an incredibly rare <laughs> commodity mm. these days as well. So uh, one of the things we particularly enjoyed on the podcast you do uh, is is the Yes No game. So we thought we'd turn the tables on you. Hopefully you've heard of some of these people, uh, <laughs> or most of these people. Uh, in fact, I'm sure you would have, but uh, stop us if you haven't. Right. Um, and, um, we, we'll go down and see what you think. So for those that don't know, uh, very – in fact – You'll work it out as, as we go along. I don't think it, I don't think it needs explanation. So, um, Alison Pearson. Alison has a resounding yes. Absolutely. A lockdown sceptic and te telegraph columnist. And I hate to big up the competition, but a really good podcast she does with them as well. Um, ben Bradley, MP. It's that's such a curveball, that one. It, it would have been a, a, an emphatic yes relatively recently. But could I just ask, did he vote for the second lockdown? That's an excellent question, and a well-researched podcast host would know the answer to that. Well, I was trying um, to look for it on Lockdown Skeptics just now because they provided a very handy list of, uh, of the brave few that voted against it. But if he's on that list, then he's a yes, but if he's not, he's reverted to being a no. Absolutely. Uh, James Melville. Oh, God, these, these are good. You've done your research because I, I, I'm, I'm, he's a yes in my book these days. Actually, for those that don't know, James was a, a massive Ramona, but has now become a massive lockdown sceptic. So, um, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, as, I'm as... loving him more each day. He, he, he is uh, genuinely honest and he wants to understand, he wants to listen to his opponents to the point whereby he, he's kind of come round to us. Absolutely. Um, Steve Baker. <sighs> no. Claire Fox. Yes. Lawrence Fox. Yes. Liam Fox. Who's Liam Fox? I, he used to be. Um, he used to be something uh, going for a place in the World Trade Organization. Oh right. Um, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll give him a yes, but uh, that that that's winging it. I'm afraid. Right, said Fred. <laughs> Emphatic yes. Again, for those that, um, that, that you know, know, those that know the show will know that we're all too sexy for our shirts. Uh, and Rice and Frank are massive lockdown skeptics, uh, which is uh, they are wonderful. Really they? Come they, they've well. come, yeah. they've come right back out of nowhere, and they are absolute legends. David Curtin. Uh, yes. Yes, so I, I, I wonder whether I mean David's uh, running for mayor of London, a, a sort of friend of the show. Uh, and uh, yeah, a, a big lockdown skeptic and a big Brexiteer, so uh, great from him. Um, Graham Brady. Uh, don't know him. Uh, 
chair of the 1922 committee, a deputy chair, I think, and voted uh, against lockdown. Well, there you go. That, I, think, I think we've answered the Absolute, question. He, absolutely. Yes. Uh, Ian Duncan Smith. He's a yes. Ian Paisley Junior. Junior. He's a yes. Absolutely. Uh, Lee Kane. Again, I don't know. I'm, I'm really pleased you said that. He's the Downing Street Director of Communications that literally no oh, one God, heard the, 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 Oh, God, him. <laughs> yeah. he, he's like a, the, the evil twin to Cummings, isn't he? <laughs> uh, a, another prematurely bold and uh, sinister uh, apparatchik. Well, he was. Yeah. <laughs> he resigned last night. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's still yes. prematurely bold. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, no one had heard of him before last night. No one had heard of, 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 of a director of communications in Downing Street before last night. So uh, it's a tricky uh, one. Did, did, I mean, did, Carrie didn't like him, did she? That's the rumor. Yes. Which, which makes me think he might be a yes. <laughs> but we'll never know now, will we? No, no that's right. <laughs> he, I'm sure he's going to go on to better things and we'll suddenly find out who he was. Um, <laughs> Dominic, which brings us on to the next person, of course, Dominic Cummings. Um, he's, he's got to be a no. I mean, like a lot of uh, really Machiavellian people, they're great when they're on your side and you're so glad to have them. But the moment they, that they seem to be working against you, you can see that the evil that everyone else saw in them. So no. Absolutely. Uh, uh, Rishi Sunak? No, oh gosh, that's another difficult one. I think on balance, it's got to be a no. I mean, what sort of chancellor spends that much money? Absolutely. And so coming and coming back to where we started the podcast, uh, Joe Jurgensen. Um, who who's he? The the Libertarian Party presidential candidate in the US. And oh the right, fa- right. Yes. <laughs> she, she, she was. She was. She was. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, I have a, a, a bit of a problem with libertarians and forming parties. I, I've got a theory that, so do they. Not new, that, <laughs> that uh, libertarians are best sort of, um, because it's like herding cats trying to get libertarians to do the same thing. Uh, libertarians should remain as a wooable organization. So they should be there as a block that uh, any incumbent party should be seeking to win the approval of rather than them finding a party that will never gain power and, and, and becoming just another Lib Dem. What do you think of that, that, that uh, theory? I think that, that's pretty sound. We, we actually uh, speak quite often with uh, chap Dan Lidicott, who... I, yeah, uh, I know Dan. Oh, excellent. Yes, yeah, so he's working with the Independent Libertarians group, which I, I rather like the look of, I have to say, as a... As a, a, a a vehicle for getting libertarian ideas out there. And, and I, I think the problem for a libertarian party is you need to, political parties can only kind of pick up on something that's already in the, in, in the society as an, as an ocean. And I'm, I'm not sure it is enough yet. And, and uh, I think he's got a possible vehicle to try and help get the ideas out that, that whether it's a libertarian party or another party with more libertarian ideas that comes along later and can can actually uh, take to fruition. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it, it we'd be better off trying to steer the more libertarian end of the Conservative Party towards more libertarian policies. But that looks like a, a, a forlorn hope at the moment with, with the Tories that we are left with. I mean, when even people like Baker are... are, are hopeless it, it, where where are you left to go apart from voting for someone like lawrence fox or or farage's new construction it, it, it it's really bleak times for uh, for democracy no absolutely and, and, and part of the reason we mentioned david curtin he set up the heritage party uh, they are socially conservative but more libertarian in 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 economics and 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 certainly around things like free speech and what have you lawrence fox's group i think will be not dissimilar um, I'm and and I'm hoping that they provide that leverage. And just frankly, you need to make some scared MPs. Some MPs that are scared of losing their positions, and then and then and then they might come round to our point of view. And, and I'm hoping that they they might just do that. Um, yeah. So, Alexandra Ocasio Cortez. 
Is she on this, this yes no game? She is. <laughs> Come on, I think we know that one. She, she's a resounding no, always has been and always will be. Can I give a, a quick wrong. case A case for yes? I think she's almost single-handedly responsible for the fact that the Republicans have clawed back seats in the House and, and retained control of the Senate. So, so you know, in, in everything that's wrong, there, there can be some uh, goodness come out of it. Um, well, I suppose that's a, a bit like thanking... Um, Jeremy Corbyn for the, the Tories winning such a massive majority, isn't it? And, and it is. Ma- making him a yes as well, if, that, if, if that's the, the criteria. But yeah, you've got a point. <laughs> um, our last few then, uh, Joe Biden. Um, <laughs> he's a no, but, uh, you know, creepy Joe, I don't think we'll be having to worry about him for too much longer, one way or another, because I think if, if the, uh, the God Emperor does get back in, all will be fine. But I think... Biden was always meant to be replaced by Kamala Harris within a few months. Now, it, honestly, to, to listeners, this, this 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 has not been shared. We we do uh, let you we, to pull up pull back the curtain. We do sort of share a bit of a script of what we're covering, but this list has not been shared with Dick. The next item is the possible president-elect Kamala Harris. <laughs> there you go. You see. Uh, well, yeah, an, an, another resounding no. Absolutely. And finally, President Donald Trump. Uh, he, he's yes to, to, the, to the power of 500. And I, I, I still hold out hope. I really do. I know James certainly does. But, uh, uh, you know, we, we should all be behind him in, in fighting for the correct result. I've got one for you, then. So what about Lord Sumption? He he was once, and uh, it's difficult to believe now. He was once a no, wasn't he? But he, mm. he, he he's he's such a yes at the moment. He he it's so great to have him talking so much sense. Yes, it's a, an interesting uh, interesting turnaround for him in his uh, in his fortunes in the yes no game. <laughs> in the last, yeah, uh, yeah, in the last few months, it's nice to see someone turning towards a yes because so many of our old allies, you know, the the, the Andrew Neils of this world, uh, have just become no's or they've just become so squishy that uh, you, you can barely call them conservatives anymore. Certainly not libertarians. Absolutely, thanks, Dick. That's, that's been been great speaking to you. Thanks for that, Dick. That was a uh, that was a good chat there, uh, Mike. We've got a few things on our uh, website that people might be interested in. We do. So, our, our, first of all, our last podcast, and highly recommend it to people. Uh, it was the the audio from our live event uh, on the future of the BBC, where we had uh, Harry Fong from the Taxpayers Alliance, uh, Sophia, one of one of the bright group leader for uh, the. Libertarian Party, a former Brighton group leader, and uh, G. Baines, one of our local councillors here in Croydon, talk about the BBC. Really good discussion, really good interaction between them uh, as well. Um, have a listen to that. Well worth uh, well worth your time. Um, we've got a great article from uh, Hongwei Chi, one of uh, one of our locals. People will know um, on what's the harm in feeding the poor. Well, uh, he, he talks about some of the concerns of quantitative easing and that massive overspend we've been talking about today, and uh, puts that uh, across in a really good way. Well worth uh, having a read of that. We've got an interview with Dr. Tom Rogers, the deputy leader of the Christian People's Alliance Party. Um, party that, that, for a small party, do rather well. Um, uh, some some sound views as well, and uh, well worth having a read of that. Just just mentioned something that, that we mentioned here. He, he came up with a comment here. Many parents got to try their hand at hold, homeschooling for the first time. It may not work for everyone, but many found they were actually quite good at it, and they enjoyed the experience. And most important of all, their kids made far greater educational process in the time than they ever would have done at a conventional school. Have a read uh, of Tom's interview if you get the opportunity. And lastly, uh, my myself on the Libertarian Listener uh, podcast, um, uh, a, a great podcast um, with uh, Chris Wilkinson. Um, uh, have a have a listen to me there if you can stand more of me. And uh, yeah, and and particularly uh, have a listen to Chris. Thanks. Well, if you'd like to uh, write for the website or have any stories you'd like us to cover, please do contact us. You can do so via the Twitter at Croydon Const, via our Facebook page, via our website, croydonconstitutionalist.uk, or via email, croydonconstitutionalist at gmail.com. Well, do please subscribe to the podcast and the podcast. 
uh, and indeed the YouTube channel. Do please like, share and leave a review. It's always good to get feedback and it helps others to find the podcast. I'd like to say thank you very much to Dick for joining us on the podcast today. Well, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. And finally, thank you to everybody for listening. Until next time, it's goodbye from me. And goodbye from me. Stay safe, everybody. Bye.